And we are now recording. Good. Hello, hello, and this is Complex Sounds. Thank God I remembered to hit that record button. I almost forgot. Anyway, we are finishing Complex Sounds, and we covered last week. We talked about the fact that almost all sounds are complex. They're com combined of many different frequencies. The only time you're hearing pure tones is under headphones during a hearing test. We talked about spectrum versus waveform, two ways to represent sound. Waveform is amplitude over time. Spectrum is frequencies on the horizontal and amplitude so that you can see the individual frequencies of a sound. We said a spectrum is like having a loaf of bread of sound, taking a slice and turning that slice sideways so you can see the frequencies inside. Okay? Think of a spectrum as a slice of sound, always. Because sound is three dimensions, and a piece of paper only has two dimensions. So you need two different ways to show all three dimensions of sound. Uh, we talked about the word Fourier analysis. I'm just looking at my notes here. I'm just, uh, we talked about the fundamental frequency in a spectrum, that that's the lowest frequency in a spectrum. We showed a spectrum of three different sounds, and we showed how all of those things can have different amplitudes. So I'm going to now share screen, and we'll take a peek see at some of these particular pictures. Why not? All righty. This is the picture I'm really talking about. We have, you have a waveforms here, and we say when you add all these waveforms, you get a complex sound, right? And then we said, here's a, we said, oh, here's a spectrum of sound. Let's go up here. A broadband spectrum. This might be a flat spectrum. We might call that white noise because the spectrum has all the different frequencies frequencies in it at a fairly equal amplitude. This here is, is also broadband sound. It's got a whole bunch of frequencies in it. All of these frequencies are in it, but the high frequencies are at a greater amplitude than the lower frequencies are. So you've got all, a spectrum is just a different way of showing you all different kinds of sounds. So then we said, here's three different musical instruments. And when you're, you've got greater amp, they, all, they have all the same fundamental frequency. They have all the same harmonics, which are equal multiples of the fundamental, remember? And, but the, the musical instruments all sound different because they have different resonances. Look at the amplitude is greater at different multiples of that fundamental at different harmonics. So we covered all of that last week. We said that resonance is, is the flip side, the upside down frown of impedance. Impedance is whatever blocks sound from going through an object. Resonance is the sound that that object likes to vibrate with. Resonance is the favorite vibrating frequency of an object. Thinking of a wine glass at Christmas and that, okay? So if, this, if the object resonates with a certain frequency, it opposes other frequencies. And it likes this one and doesn't like the other ones. And impedance, the doesn't like thing, is comprised of three pieces we said, didn't we? And we laid great emphasis on that. In fact, we went to the bottom of the page here, and we talked about, oh, let's see, resistance and impedance. And that last sentence there, I'm going to quiz you, or you're going to see this on a midterm, okay? You will see this stuff. You will see fundamental frequency. You will see harmonics. You probably will see Fourier analysis, what I'm talking about there, okay? All of these things are meant as concepts that are meant to be memorized in your heads. These are the physical properties of sound and how it carries through things. So resonance, put that puppy in your back pocket, okay? It's the flip side of impedance. And what is impedance? Opposition due to mass and opposition due to stiffness. 
Mass resonates with low frequencies. Mass opposes highs. Stiffness resonates with high frequencies. Stiffness opposes lows. And then there's a third element, and that's resistance. And in any object, resistance is like simple friction. And resistance to sound in any object is the same for all frequencies. Okay? So basically, opposition due to, sound, to mass and opposition due to stiffness are called reactants. And there's what you see at the bottom of your page. And reactance plus resistance equals impedance. And that whole ball of wax flipped upside down is resonance. So there you have it. When the opposition due to mass in an object is equal to the opposition due to stiffness in an object at whatever frequency that occurs, yea, e'en so verily, that is the resonant frequency. I didn't make this stuff up. It's in the textbook, but we know that stuff. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All right. I'm even saying that from north of the border. Ah. All righty, here we go. So we now go to the next thing, and we're going to be talking today a lot about speech, about speech as a complex sound. That's what we said last week, and by gum, that's what we've got to finish today. If you look at the top of page two, we talked about resonance and impedance acting as filters. You'll see that in your thing. We covered that. We then said that noise has a non-periodic waveform. Noise is not tonal. Noise can be transient or turbulent. So let's look at these concepts a second here. Okay, speech, we'll get back to that in a second here. These are filters, the top of the page too. A low pass filter obviously resonates with lows, doesn't resonate with highs. So an object, let's say this cup. If this cup resonated with low frequencies, it would act as a low-pass filter. It likes the lows. The bouncer is keeping out the highs. On the other hand, a high-pass filter is something that lets highs through it, doesn't let lows through it. A band-pass filter is something that lets a certain area of frequencies through it, but nothing higher and nothing lower. It's a combination of a low pass and a high pass filter. And the opposite of a band pass would be a band reject filter. It lets everything through except certain frequencies. Okay? So all these things we need to look at and understand and make sure we, under, we have it down. I think we ended last week. Okay, we end. Oh, here, this is a, a picture of a noise waveform, okay, aperiodic or non-periodic. There is no repetition or pattern seen in this waveform. And I'm going to contrast it right now to a waveform here. Have a look at this bottom one here. This is a complex sound made out of three different frequencies, A plus B plus C. And even though it looks jagged, I can see a pattern to it. So that's not going to be complete noise. It's going to have some kind of a hum. It's going to have something. But when you contrast that to something like this, I mean, there is no pattern to that. Now, noise is going to then be not tonal. Noise is going to be like... Now, this noise happens to be white noise because its amplitude spectrum is flat. It's got all frequencies at the same amplitude. It, then again, we can have pink noise we discussed last week. And this would show an example of pink noise. It may, like right here, more energy in the low frequencies, less energy in the high frequencies. So white noise might sound like, for, I'm just giving an example, pink noise might sound like 
but by gum, they're both noises, okay? One waterfall can sound different from another waterfall, but they're all noises, but they don't have, a waterfall isn't going, <laughs> it's going, <laughs> all right? Noise is, can be transient or it can be turbulent. So back to pink noise for just a second. We said speech. The spectrum, here's the spectrum of speech. It's got more energy in the lows and less energy in the highs. And what are these dotted lines for um, above and below the solid line? That just shows you that speech fluctuates in amplitude. Okay, as I'm speaking, some parts of my speech are louder than the other. So, but remember, this is just a slice over time. But speech basically has about a 30 decibel dynamic range. From its loudest to its softest is about 30 decibels of a distance. And the mean average of speech, here's your red in the center. And it's, notice it's not quite in the center. Isn't that remarkable? If it was noise, the mean average would be right in the middle. Do you know why it's not in the middle for speech? The reason why, and you're going to learn about this next year, so don't freak about it this year, okay? But next year, you're going to be taking hearing aids and all kinds like compression, fitting methods, uh, real ear measurement, all of that crap. And when you take hearing aids more into detail, you're going to find out about digital noise reduction. Now, speech as a signal is staccato. I'm going to turn off my share screen so I can just talk at you for a second. Speech is staccato. In English, that means speech is... Speech is not... Okay? Un like an air conditioner or a fan or even the hubbub the word we use hubbub or babble of background speech that's fairly steady in intensity over time noise is assumed to be quite steady in intensity over time speech the sound of my flapping gums to you right now ain't. Speech is wubba 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 wubba. It's a waveform is going bubba 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 bubba. It's constantly changing in amplitude over time. And because it's doing that, it has an abnormal, get this, an abnormal distribution. Yep, st stats, an abnormal intensity layout. The intensity of speech fluctuates rapidly over time. And because it does that, its mean, its average, is not in the center of its intensity range. And that, folks, is what digital hearing aids do. They use digits. They use math. Your digital hearing aids are statistically sampling sound coming into their mics. And if the sound is steady in intensity over time, the hearing aid goes, it's noise, reduce the gain. And if the hearing aid is receiving sound that's fluctuating rapidly in intensity over time, the hearing aid's brain says, oh, that's speech, amplify the crap out of it. See that? All right, you're going to cover this ground again probably unfortunately with me next year. But we will, see, we will see this picture again. Just remember you saw it first here. Ha! All right. Carry on now. We are on page two. Oh, yes. And we talked about, we talked also about, I'll stop sharing now. We talked about broadband noise versus narrow bands of noise. Remember that last week? That's how we ended. White noise, BBN, broadband noise, pink noise sloping down like speech, and then narrow bands of noise like someone flipping you the bird, okay? You've got those narrow bands of noise, and those narrow bands of noise are used in audiometry. Oh, lovely. What, 130? 
taking home, is it 1.30? Audiometry, you'll be studying masking, covering the good ear while a test is being done. It's done by narrow bands of noise. When your subject or client is receiving a thousand hertz in his bad ear, they're going to put narrow band 1000 hertz noise in the good ear to keep it busy. When your subject is being tested at 2000 hertz in his or her bad ear, they're going to put a narrow band of noise at surrounding 2000 hertz in the guy's good ear to keep it busy again. And when they're putting speech into the bad ear and you're testing the clarity of speech in the bad ear, they're going to put pink noise into the good ear to keep it busy. Why? Because pink noise has the same spectrum as speech. More energy in the lows, less in the highs. Making sense? Good. All right. I really like teaching this class because at least I've got people here. You know, when I'm teaching the 250 course, real ear measurement, there's nobody here. I'm just talking at my face. And it's such a drag. <laughs> so this is great. And remember now, if you have questions, stop me and ask, okay? All right, here it goes. Back to sharing screen here. And we will now continue where we left off last week, and that was with beets. And I remember telling you that I couldn't stand beets, the vegetable called beets. I don't know how people eat it, but that's just me. That's because I'm a whiner. Okay, all right, where are we with good old beets? Let's figure that out here. Ah, yes, here you go. Take a peek, see at this sound. Ah, you got a complicated slide here. Look at this. Let me break it down for you. You've got three frequencies here, 100 hertz, 200 hertz, 300 hertz. And you're adding these three together, and guess what? You got your sum total. Now, notice the black dots, A, B, C. Those are time. That's in time, right? Waveforms are amplitude over time. So holding those three black dots constant, look at the phase of each wave at time A. And now look at the phase of each wave at time B. And now the phase of each wave at time C. At time, these phases add to each other, and sometimes they detract from each other. Think of windshield wipers on a bus. You ever sat on a city bus and looked at the windshield wipers? They really bug me. Because they'll go like this. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then one will go a little bit faster. And they'll till finally, they're totally out of phase. And then finally, they'll slowly go back into phase. There'll be one time when, boom, they're going right together again. But they won't stay there. Eventually, they're falling completely out of phase, and they're doing this, okay? Same thing with sound. Sometimes the waves are in phase. Sometimes they're out of phase. So when you look at the bottom, you can see that at times you're getting a bigger wave and at times you're getting completely negative. So that's all that that's showing you. Now in English, to break this down, memorize this. If you have a 1000 hertz tone and a 1001 hertz tone and you add them together, they're going to be in and out of phase one time per second. So you're going to hear this. You're going to hear one beat per second. If you take a 1,000 hertz tone and add a 1,002 hertz tone to it, you're going to hear two beats per second. If you take a 1,005 hertz tone and a 1,000 hertz tone and play them together, you're going to hear like five beats per second. Until finally, you're going to hear two separate tones. There's always been two separate tones, but your brain and your hearing system can't 
separate them as two separate tones until they're far enough apart, okay, more than five or six hertz apart. And then all of a sudden, you're not going to hear beats anymore. You're going to hear, no, no, there's two separate tones there. Huh. But when they're less than, say, 10 hertz apart, you're going to hear a various number of beats per second. And the number of beats per second you're going to hear is the distance between the two frequencies in, in frequency. Got it? Cool. Done. We're done beats. I never did like eating pickled beets anyhow. All right, now we are getting to some weird stuff here. And let's just talk about strange looking waves. First of all, here's a, we're going to just to finish our noise discussion here. White noise, look at its waveform. And look at its fairly flat spectrum. Now, this is really science. I mean, this is no longer drawing nice flat pictures in a book. This is actual measurements. White noise, there's its waveform. And here's its fairly flat spectrum. Fairly. It's got these weird dips in there, but fairly flat. Here's low-pass noise. Once again, it's noise because you can't see a repetition in the waveform. I see no pattern. Its spectrum, mostly lows. Here's bandpass noise, I guess. I don't know. This is the waveform of some bandpass noise. Here's its spectrum. It's a narrow band surrounding 2,000 hertz in this case. Just showing you pictures. Now we're going to get to some weird, here's again, here's a waveform. Here's its spectrum. Here's a wave. Here's its spectrum. Here's a wave. Here's its spectrum. You can tell these are getting higher and higher in frequency because the waves are getting shorter and shorter. The period is getting shorter. The wavelength is getting shorter. So obviously, from this wave to this wave to this wave, you're getting higher and higher and higher frequency spectra. Basically, adding one, two, three, and four together, right at the bottom, here's your weird looking wave. Take a spectrum of that wave. You got four different frequencies to it. It's hard to see. Do you see what I'm saying now? If you looked at this wave, and I was to say, what frequencies are in there? And you'd say, I don't know, it's a complex wave, I know that. And you'd say, yep, it's tonal, because it repeats over time. But what frequencies are there? You'd have to go, oh my God. Okay, what's the time? Okay, how many, how many times did I get this tall wave over some unit of time? And you'd have to calculate to figure out frequency is one over the period. Period is one over the frequency. Shoot, do a spectrum analysis of it or a Fourier analysis on the computer. And it says, the frequencies are 100, 200, 300, and 400 hertz. Okay? See, this spectrum at the bottom right is the slice. Look at me now. It's the slice of this loaf of bread. You're taking a slice, and you're turning it sideways to see the raisins. Okay? Mm, mm, mm. In the head. Da. Like Russian. All right, we now know. Da! We go to the next picture now. Okay. You know what's really weird? And we're going to study this in weeks to come. We'll just, we're going to pass this one. But this is the case of the missing fundamental. Check this out. Here's a complex wave with all four frequencies. Did you know that we can take out the fundamental frequency, look at this, the bottom one, we've taken this one away, and yet, and here's its wave now on the left, but guess what? We're still going to hear the overall fundamental frequency in that tone. This tone will not sound any different than that tone. Isn't that weird? They call that the case of the missing fundamental. And we will pass this way again when we go into psychoacoustics. And you will say, oh, yeah, I heard him say that before.
okay? And again, it's because of our brain. We ain't perfect. We can analyze a lot of sound, but sometimes when the fundamental frequency is removed, it makes no real difference to our overall perception of the sound because the, the harmonics are equal multiples of that fundamental frequency, and they're all the same space apart. And our brain is using that to calculate what this must have been. Do -de -do 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 -de -de -do. I was in Minneapolis this past weekend, or this past week, I caught a nasty cold. Terrible. You're, I'm l really lucky, and so are you, that I'm not blowing my nose constantly because uh, I just happen to be in a lull right now. But I, I, it's a, that, was a, that was a humdinger. That was a cold from hell. Anyway, so now we looked at this. We looked at this. Let us find out. Oh, yeah, here we go. Bottom of page two. Here's some weird-looking waves. Here's a complex periodic wave that's called a sawtooth wave because its shape looks like the teeth of a saw. And how did they build that wave? Well, 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 three holes in the ground. Here's how they did it. They took this big wave and they added this wave and they added this wave. So when they added one and two, S this top one, and this next one, you got this wave to the right. When they added the third wave to the above two, you got this. And as they kept on adding waves in the correct manner, you ended up with a real sharp-looking complex wave. And the rule of that, don't think you have to memorize this. My God, I haven't. I don't walk around knowing all this crap. I'm just showing you stuff here. When you add harmonics, equal multiples of the fundamental frequency, and you drop the intensity by quite a bit, by a certain rule, okay, you will get a sawtooth wave. If you have this scene, a different scene, check this one out. Here you have a wave. You're adding this wave. And you're adding another wave, and you're adding another wave, and you're doing it differently than you did with the sawtooth. A different rule. <clears throat> ah, there was my first cough. Okay, so add wave one and two, you got this. Add wave three to one and two, you get this. And add four to one, two, and three, you get this. And keep going with the same rule, you'll get a square wave. Little Jack Horner sat in the corner and got a square rear end, if you know what I mean. Okay? Square waves, sawtooth waves, square waves. Here's the rule of thumb for square waves. You'll have a harmonic, and then you'll miss the next harmonic. Look at this one. They don't take 400. Uh-uh. They take the second harmonic only. And then they don't take... 800 hertz, uh-uh, you just leave that one out, you just take a 1,000. So you're just adding the odd, you know, the, just the even harmonics and not the odd ones. Okay, they're just doing, they're just skipping things. You'll get a square wave. I don't know, I didn't make it up. Here's a triangular wave, check this one out. A triangular wave. Here, they're adding Odd, just the, the, the every second harmonic again. See that? Every second harmonic again. I see somebody's kitty cat. You know, cats can hear much higher frequencies than we can. At any rate, look at the way they're doing here. They're, they're missing this harmonic. They're taking 300. They're missing the next one. They're taking 500. So now they're taking just the odd harmonics here. Look at that. They're missing things, but look at the drop-down rate. The drop-down rate is kind of different than this, okay? The, just a, a, a different rule. And when you're doing that, da 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 da, 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 da you finally you're ending up with a triangular wave. Weird stuff. Just giving you examples of how complex sounds can be built.
Here's a summary of what we talked about. Sawtooth wave. Have a look at this picture. It's amplitude spectrum. You're taking every harmonic and you're dropping them by 6 dB per octave. Square wave. You're taking every second harmonic, not every harmonic. Okay? <clears throat> Here's where the cold comes in. No worries. I'll, I, won't, I won't cough in your face. Besides, you won't catch it anyway. Now, so you see the difference? I'm just summarizing here. Same dB per octave drop-off, but you're just taking every second wave or every second harmonic. Square wave versus sawtooth. Here's a sine wave, a regular pure tone. It's amplitude spectrum. Sawtooth wave, square wave, showing you the corresponding spectra. Triangular wave, the way they drop it. Ooh, look at this. 6 dB per octave for sawtooth, 6 dB per octave for square, 12 dB per octave for triangular, white noise, flat. <coughs> no matter, we're all good. Okay, now it's time to turn to page three. Don't think you have to memorize that sawtooth square stuff. You can if you like. I'm not sure if I'll put that on or not, but I, I just just giving you examples, just so you see it. We really want to look at speech, and this is how we want to whistle down the last 30-minute corridor of this half of the course. Speech. Huge. Big events. Big events in the lives of little men. Let me finish this cup of coffee so I can turn it over to show you a quarter wave resonator. Uh, all right, good stuff. Okay, I don't want to spill on the key, on the computer keys here. Okay, here is a cylinder. Open at one end. Okay, on your picture, there's your cylinder. Open at one end. Quarter wave resonators are cylinders open at one end. Two are in our field. One's the ear canal. One's the voice. Okay, both your vocal tract and your ear canals are quarter wave resonators. That means that they vibrate best or they resonate with sounds that are four times the length of the cylinder. So this cup is about six inches long, so it's going to resonate with sound waves that are about two feet long. But I didn't make it up. That's what it's going to do. Okay, all right. Next page, here's your face. Now, here, look at this guy's face. He's got a nasal cavity behind his nose. And then he has his palate, where I'm showing you right there. And here's his mouth going down to his throat. Here's his Adam's apple. Now, your voice box is not a box. Okay, it doesn't have strings like a guitar going across the top of it. Uh-uh. Your voice. If you looked down your throat at your larynx, you'd see a round white thing with doors that would open like this. Okay? Now these doors open and shut really fast. When I'm blowing air from my lungs out, the doors will pop open, and because the air is rushing through, they're going to snap shut. Now, I think I showed you this last week, but just for fun, I should just show it to you again. Although, if I do it with this here, I'll, I'll, I'll lose my paper. So let me just grab two pieces of paper here so I can show you. I'm going to fold this guy like this. I'm going to cut it in half. Oh, it's nice to have a live class. I'm telling you, it's just so much better than having an empty computer to talk in. Humans are a social thing, you know? Now, I'm going to stop sharing here, and I'm going to blow paper in your face. Notice how the papers stick together? You'd think they blow apart, but they don't. They, blow, they stick together. Birds of a feather don't stick together. How come? That's the Bernoulli effect. B-E-R 
N O U L L I. Bernoulli. He's from Italiano. He's Italian, eh? He like the pizza. Or maybe the spaghetti. Now, Bernoulli figured out that when you have air rushing through something, the pressure decreases because the air is rushing through, so the things are going to close. Okay? It's the same thing with an airplane. By the way, BTW, by the way, if you look at an airplane wing from the end, you will see if you take a cross section of an airplane wing, it's flat on the bottom and it's round on the top. Okay? How many of you have flown in an airplane before? Okay, just you look at the wing. The wing is round on the top, it's flat on the bottom. That's the Bernoulli effect. Air is going to pass under the bottom of the wing, okay, as the plane flies, but Air is really going to have to, oh my God, I broke the lead of my pencil. The air is really, really, really going to have to bend over the top of the wing. So the air going over the top of the wing is moving faster than the air going under the bottom of the wing. Capiche? That's why the airplane goes up. Because the air rushing over the top of the wing is moving faster than the air underneath the wing, and so you have decreased pressure, air pressure, on top of the wing. You have a, like a vacuum on top of the wing. And that's why airplanes lift. That's why they go up. Okay? Serious stuff. I never made it up. It's true stuff. So, back to your voice. Let's share screen again. Isn't that special? Let's share. Okay, so you're looking at the voice. So when air pushes between the two flaps, the air is going to suck the two flaps together again. But then air builds up underneath them again. Boom, they're open. But the air rushing through slams them shut again. But the air pressure underneath bursts them open. And the air rushing through pulls them back together again. You have a rapid poof, 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 poof. That's your voice. In a guy, that happens 125 times a second. That's the fundamental frequency of a male voice. In a woman, that happens 250 times a second. So that's the fundamental frequency of a woman's voice. In a baby, that happens 450 times per second. So that's the fundamental frequency of a baby's voice. Yeah? Cool. Cool. Did you know that a baby's voice has a lot of... Do you know why a baby's cry can really disturb or make sure that you attend to it? because it's going to resonate right in your ear canal, and your ear canal has a peak resonance around 3,000 hertz. Babies are meant to be heard. Like, meant to be. <laughs> Listen to me. I need help now. <laughs> so here you're looking at, they call it your vocal folds. Okay, that's your larynx. Speech. Just like you have the twang of a string, over a guitar. Ooh, the string is the fundamental frequency. The body of the guitar is the resonating chamber. Got it? The vocal fold fundamental frequency is basically what causes speech, but your head is the chamber, just like the guitar is. So your head is the resonating chamber. So two male larynxes or laryngees, if they have proper Latin or whatever, two male larynxes side by side are going to sound quite the same. What makes Bob's voice sound different from 
Jim's voice is the fact that Bob has a different head than Jim. So Bob's head voice is going to have a different resonating chamber than Jim's voice is going to have. They've got different heads. So they're going to sound different. And that's what makes the quality of voices sound different from person to person. Very important. Now, here we go again with this. Oh, yeah, I think. Ah, finally. Okay, got my computer. Started, I got that weird sticking problem. Okay, so here's vocal folds open, closed, open, closed, showing you one complete cycle of vocal fold vibration viewed from the larynx. Successive time frames are illustrated from left to right. Here's a close up. Nasal cavity for your mm, n n ng, ng, okay all the, and then you've got your lips and your your palate. Here's your tongue underneath here, and then down to the back of your throat, and here's your vocal folds. The anatomy of the human vocal tract. It includes your oral cavity and your nasal cavity and your pharynx, the back of your throat, all of that. This here, from your vocal folds to your lips, is about 17 centimeters. Okay? From your vocal folds to your lips is about 17 centimeters. It's important because that's going to tell you the resonating frequency of the human voice. It's just going to have a specific kind of a resonance. So if that's 17 centimeters, let's do the math here. If it's a quarter wave resonator, it's going to resonate with sound waves four times at four times its length. What's four times 17? Get your calculator out. Four times 17 is 17 times four is equal to 68. So that's 0.68 meters. Okay, so that's, that's the wavelength. So 0.68 meters. Remember, wavelength equals speed of sound over the frequency. Remember that one? So why not just leave it like that? Say, wavelength, 0.68 meters over 1 is equal to 340, because that's the speed of sound in air, 340 meters per second, over frequency. Wavelength over 1 is equal to 340 over the frequency. So now, do your cross multiplication. You've written down that little fraction. Have you done that? 340 over 1 is equal, I should say, 0.68 over 1 is equal to 340 over x. You're trying to figure out x. So in sixth grade, you all learned how to figure out for x. You cross multiply. You're going to go 1 times 340 is 340, and 340 divided by 0.68, and what are you going to get? About 500, about 500 hertz. So your vocal tract is going to like 500 hertz. It's, it's going to kind of dig that. It's a, that's one of the resonating frequencies of the vocal tract. Now, if you want to know why your voice gets higher when you breathe helium, inhale a helium balloon. Stop sharing, Venema. Now they got to look at your ugly face again. Here we go. Now breathe a helium balloon. <laughs> no, that wasn't a joint. Okay, I'm just <laughs> breathing helium balloon. And now I'm talking because my voice is really high. You ever done that before? I have. love doing it. Any party that's got a helium balloon, if I come to MHS and they've got helium balloons around, I'm going to do it just to bug them, okay? Inhale a helium. Why does your voice get high? Because the speed of sound in helium is faster. In fact, the speed of sound in helium, I think, is 920 meters per second or 930 meters per second. It's faster. So, wavelength. Over 1, 0.68, there's the length of your vocal tract times 4. 0.68 over 1 is equal to 920 or whatever divided by or over x. 
What's the frequency? 1 times 920 is 920. 920 divided by 0.68. You've got a higher frequency. That's why your voice gets higher with helium. Hey, parlor tricks, man. <laughs> got to do it. All right, back to where we are. Let's finish today by talking more about speech per se. It's very important. Now I got to hang on. I got to blow my nose a second. Okay. We're not too formal here, just a bit. Okay, so now let's go to our typed writing here. And we'll move away and just talk really about speech. Let's read this together. Top of page three. Speech as a complex sound. Fundamental frequency in a male voice is about 125, in a female about 250, in a child's about 450 to 500. Formants, as seen on a spectrogram. I ah, don't worry about it. Formants, though, that word means resonances of the human vocal tract. That's what that word means. <coughs> Excuse me. Voice quality. Each larynx may produce very similar fundamental frequency, but each face has different mass and stiffness properties. Therefore, the resonances or formants are different from person to person. But basically, the first one's going to hover around 500 hertz. That's it's a sort of a thing. But think of the larynx as the reed and the face as the horn, with its own particular mass and stiffness properties. And then when we looked at, look at the stuff here. We covered that. You see that at the bottom of your screen? That's the stuff that we just played with. I hadn't looked at it, but I have taught this course before, so I had a dim reckoning of it, okay? Anyway, enough on that. Let's look at this. Because that's the part that is a, a lot on your midterm. This part right there. I want you to all concentrate carefully and divide speech into three things. Vowels, unvoiced consonants, and voiced consonants. Now let's look at what these are again. Remember last week I introduced this right at the very beginning of our talk. Now we're nearing the end of this topic, so we're covering it again. But now you'll have a better understanding of it. Here we go. Vowels. A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. Vowels are mostly tonal. Unless you have a bad cold and then you've got rasping and you've got a bit of noise happening. But basically, vowels are the... Da -da 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 -da. Vowels are pure larynx. Vowels are not using my lips. They're just a, e, o, a. Now I'm making my mouth different. Look at that. A, e, e. I'm squeezing e. So I'm I'm separating my vocal tract into like a figure eight. You know, I'm changing the shape. I'm morphing the shape of my horn. It's just like a trombone. You get that. I'm changing the length of that of, of that vocal track. I'm, I'm I'm messing around with it. I'm not changing the read. I'm not changing the amount of times my lips are vibrating per second. I'm changing the properties of the horn, and that's what makes a trombone. Okay. Now, same thing with your face. A a, E, A, O, U. And by the way, B, T, W, the long I, ah, a lot of European countries don't have that. They'll have E, A, but I, that's two sounds. I, I, the long vowel I, like I'm going to the store, is actually two things. I, <laughs> okay, E. It's just one. E, I can't sustain I. I, I, I'll have to do it again. I, 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 just like oil. Oi, oi, oi. That's two sounds. It's O, E. Oil. Oi, oi, oi. It's, they call that a diphthong. 
It's got two things. I'm teaching you speech pathology. This is what they study at Missouri State, several blocks away from Ozarks Technical College, where they'll get their master's degree in speech language pathology. This is exactly what they're studying. Okay? They are studying acoustics and the face. All about the face, how that works, and whether you have a cleft palate. And now you're hypernasal because a lot of the sound is leaking out. They'll study deaf speech. Well, the person can't hear the high frequency of speech until he or she is talking like this because they can't hear the letter S. They never heard the letter S before. So they can't make that little V. They never heard the letter S, so they can't make it. So really, it's a trick, speech and hearing. Anyway, vowels are pure tonal, and vowels are louder and lower. In speech, vowels, think of the two L's, louder, lower. Think of the name Paul, P-A-U-W, P-A, I can't even spell, P-A-U-L, Paul. If I yell Paul, what's the loudest part of Paul? It's the ah. The p isn't very loud, okay? If I say speech, speech, what's the loudest part of speech? E. If I say church, go to church for once. Worship the Lord. Go to church. So if I say church, what's the loudest part of that word? Er. It's the vowel. It's vowels are louder and lower. Vowels pick up a word like a snowball, and vowels throw it across the street. Vowels contain the energy of speech. Okay? They are the loudest part. That's what makes speech hurl through the air. Consonants don't. Consonants are softer, Cons especially unvoiced consonants. Take the letters S. Now look at the right-hand column of your screen here. Now let's share the screen here again and look at the right-hand column. I see Lizzie talking on the phone. Anyway, I'm just teasing you. Here, look at the unvoiced consonants. S, S. Not one of those is using my larynx. Put your hand to your throat now. Do it yourself. So you really internalize this. With me, say, say, reading down your page. You can't feel your voice at all. It's not being used. Say the letter P. The letter T. Ch. Ch. It's not using the voice. That's why they're called unvoiced consonants. Unvoiced consonants are high in frequency, and they're also soft. They're very soft. And they're noise. Look at that. Look what it says underneath. Non-periodic, mostly noise, high frequency. Well, guess what? What do most elderly people have with hearing loss? What kind of hearing loss do they have? Where is their hearing loss most pronounced? In your audiometry, have you studied this yet? Have you studied that lovely word called presbycusis? Presbycusis reminds me of Presbyterian. Presbyterian means church of the elders as opposed to the bishops or deacons, okay? Presbyopia means my arms aren't long enough to see the page. I, I, I'm 61 now. I can't see stuff close up. I have to wear glasses, which, by the way, I got in Springfield, Missouri. Just thought I'd tell you. I can't see. I have, when I'm reading the paper, I have to put my glasses on because I hit 40. That's what happens when you hit 40, okay? When you hit 65, you've got hearing loss in the treble. It's trouble with treble. And that's presbycusis. Presby is the Greek word for elder. Presbyterian, church of the elders. Presbyopia, vision loss in the elders. Presbycusis, hearing loss in the elders. And that's the most common hearing loss in the world. It actually acts as a low-pass filter. It only lets the lows in. Elderly people can hear the vowels just fine. That's why they're saying, you don't need to shout at me, young man. You just need to speak more clearly. Well, the coin's got two sides. Yep, maybe the young person isn't speaking clearly, but guess what? 
turn the coin the other way around, you've got high pitch hearing loss. And so you can't hear the difference between kittens and mittens, dishes and fishes. Look at this. Fat, hat, bat, sat, cat. They all have ah, 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 but it's the k that tells you all of what the word is. That carries 100% of the meaning of the word. That's why the elderly say, I can hear, I just can't discriminate. I can't distinguish between words that rhyme. I can't hear the difference between words that are close together. And so they're always looping. They're always, did they were talking about dishwashing liquid? Were they talking about cleaning? They're always cycling to figure out what you must have been talking about, which makes you tired. And then they go, you guys go on out and have a good time. I'm going to stay back and read a book. That's the isolating factor of hearing loss. It's the trouble with treble. They can't hear high frequencies of speech. And what are those? The unvoiced consonants. See, I told you acoustics has meaning. It has all kinds of meaning. That's why it, it, it's so important that people who work in this field have a grasp of that, because you're going to be explaining this to people. No, you're not going to be talking about quarter wave resonators. But you're going to be having an audiogram in front of you with the sounds of speech laid right across it. And you're going to show the person how his hearing loss goes down like this and how he can hear the vowels, but he can't hear the consonants. And that person's going to go home thinking, you know what? That person explained my hearing problems better than my doctor ever did. That person explained my difficulties better than anyone else did in the hearing in the healthcare sector. Well, no kidding, because you're a hearing instrument specialist. That's what's going to drum you business, is a good explanation. When you explain yourself well, you are selling. And selling ain't a dirty word. Switch it for educating. You're going to go to a salesperson who taught you. Even if you pay a little more. I'm going to go to the person who explained the product better to me because I love that explanation. That's what did it for me. That hung the moon for me. Shut up, Ted. Talk about speech again. Okay, so over here, looking at your consonants and carrying on here, carefully look at this now. Here's your vowels, and let's break it down. What are the voiced consonants? The voiced ones are the mixtures. So if you take the letter F and put a voice in it, now I have a V. You see that? That's why I made them go right across from each other. If you take the letter S and put a voice in it, now you have a Z. If you take the letter P and put a voice in it, now you have a B. If you take the letter T and you put a voice in it, t, t, d, d, now you have a D. If you take the letter CH and put a voice in it, ch, ch, j, j, now you have a J. Okay? If you have the letter K, k, k and you put a voice in it, g, g, I'm going. Oh, could you? Yes, I'm going. They both are using the tongue. Look at the letter K. You're using the back of your tongue against the roof of your mouth. You can't lip read, by the way, the letter K. And anybody with hearing loss will tell you, you can lip read quite a bit of sounds, but you can't lip read all sounds. The only lip reading sounds you can read are the ones from the lips. But but, you know, this stuff. But you can't read K's because it's in the back. All right, just trying to tell you, you can squeeze your mouth in three areas. The lips, the tongue against the back of your front teeth, and the tongue against the roof of your mouth. So let's do that once. P, front, t, middle, Back, k, back, p, t, k, front, middle, back, p, t, k, p, t, k, front, middle, back. By the way, that's a speech pathology exercise. 
That is why the nursery rhyme, patty cake, patty cake, baker's man is such a good one for children because it's front, middle, back, front, middle, back, puttaka, puttaka. They're using the puttaka, okay? They're using all three possible constrictions of your mouth making speech sounds. Speech pathology, yeehaw! All right, here we go. Speech on a spectrum, we're about done now. We've covered our hour here. Vowels are more intense and lower in frequency. Consonants are softer and higher. Vowels, you've, every word has a vowel. Every stinking word in English has a vowel. How many vowels do you have? Five or six. So all those five or six vowels have to be shared among 3,000 or more words. So vowels don't tell you what a word is. Vowels just tell you that speech is spoken. Consonants, are they tell you what the word is. Voiced and unvoiced consonants together tell you what the word is. Sit, hit, pit, mit, kit. I'll say a bad one. Shit, okay? Shit, it's the... It's the high-pitched and voiced consonants that tell you what the word is. So if you look up here, back to where we were for a second, voiced consonants are in the middle. Vowels are louder and lowest. Unvoiced consonants are higher and softer. Vowels are tonal. Unvoiced consonants are pure noise. And voiced consonants are a mixture. Voiced consonants are in the center. They're a combination. That's what it says. Look where, I'm, look where my cursor is. Vowels, mostly periodic. Unvoiced consonants, mostly non-periodic. Consonant, voiced consonants, combination. Vowels, mostly tonal. Unvoiced consonants, mostly noise. Voiced consonants, combination. Look on the left again. Vowels, low frequency. Unvoiced consonants, mid frequency. Voiced consonants, mid frequency. They're right in the center. Right on the corner and right on the prize. So from a Oklahoma discount furniture when I used to live on, in Oklahoma City. I will never forget that, commer that commercial. Oklahoma discount furniture, right on the corner and right on the prize. <laughs> Anyhow, last thing here, you've got that too. Just for fun. But here's your presbycusis and audibility of speech. Okay, that, there's the stuff we talked about. Just have a read of that. That's just stuff we talked about. S-W-T-A, stuff we talked about. <laughs> there we go. And the last thing here, resonance of your outer ear canal. And so, so just for fun, have a read of that. It too is a cylinder, open at one end. So it's also a quarter wave resonator. EAM, external auditory meatus, ear canal, two and a half centimeters long. Four times two and a half is 10. 10 centimeters is 0.1 meter. 0.1 over one is equal to 340 over X. There's your division for you. 340 divided by 0.1, just do your cross multiplication, you get 3,400 hertz. That would be the resonance of your outer ear canal. But look at me here, your ear canal is flesh and bone. It's not glass. So that 3,400 is going to get fudged and spread. Basically, your ear canal resonance spreads from 1500 hertz, I would memorize this, spreads from 1500 hertz out to 4000 hertz. It's a spread, okay? It's not exactly at 3400 hertz, it's flesh and bone, okay? So it's going to be fudged a bit, but there you have it. All right, that's good. You've put up with me long enough. I don't have to say it vice versa because I really enjoy talking to you all. So anybody have any questions? Are we okay? Has this been, this has been acoustics, your first half of the course. This is all we're going to cover on sound, sound waves. We're done now. The latter half of the course 
is on perception of sound. And that's where we're going to talk about where DBHL comes from on the audiogram. Because DBHL is not DBSPL. It's a little bit different. Okay? And that's where we're going to talk about equal loudness. We're going to talk about pitch compared to frequency, loudness compared to intensity, all of that stuff. More the human perception of it. Okay? No so formulas? No formulas. <laughs> Ain't none. No formulas. We're done. Yep. That part, that debt to France has done been paid. <laughs> All right, we're good. Okay. Adios. Adios. Live long and prosper. We'll see you oh, when we we'll look no at you. No class next week, right, uh, Doctor? No class next week? No, there's no class next week. Okay. To the best of my knowledge, I, I can't imagine how there would be. You need to write a midterm. I'm, I'm told. I think it. Did Lynn tell you? I can't remember if it's proctored or not. I just don't remember. No, it's not proctored. Okay. It's already. Like, it's up. Shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> you're all going to get straight A's because what the hey, you're good. All right. I'll stop recording here.